This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with New Yorker book critic and a Harvard professor of literary criticism, James Wood, author of How Fiction Works. James Wood is the book critic at The New Yorker and the former book critic at The New Republic. He's also the professor of the practice of literary criticism at Harvard University, and he's got a new book called How Fiction Works has already gotten a lot of acclaim, as he himself has in the world of book criticism. James, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Having read your book, I suppose I should feel a little bit silly that my first question is about the book's title, but it is. It's about the third word, the word italicized on the cover of How Fiction Works. That's the word works. And there's been some discussion about this. By works, do you mean how fiction operates as in how a car's engine works? Or do you mean how fiction works as in, boy, that, that really works, that, how something works well? Yes, I think I, mean, I think I do mean the latter more than the former, but I don't think you can get to the latter without the former. To explain why something works well is to explain, as in car mechanics, why it's working at all. And so the two things are related. And I, do, I did want to write a book in which I'm obviously doing some of that mechanics business of taking things apart and seeing how they, you know, putting them under the light and seeing how they work and so on. And then trying as a reader to put them back together again and say, okay, so now, now we can go to evaluation. Now we can go to set, to, to now, now our understanding of why something is so good uh, is is ideally improved. That that that's the idea, at least. And this isn't a project that's a recent thing for you. This didn't start with the writing of the book. I mean, you've been trying to for your entire career figure out how fiction works. Correct? Yeah, I, I'm. I've always been uh, uh, as a as a critic and and reviewer, um, uh, fairly hands on ish. And um, when I bump into writers, they will they will they will sometimes say to me, you know. It seems to me that you're 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 always trying to you're always trying to describe fiction from the inside. So I, I think yes, I've been I, I've been I've been um, I've always been someone who wants to open up the sentence, look at how a metaphor works, uh, look at why the right adjective, you know, why the ad, a particular adjective is the right one, and so on. Specifically, this this book came out of uh, the last few years in which I've been teaching. I've been teaching some undergraduates at Harvard part time. And I've also been doing some classes at Columbia with the MFA students there, the creative writers who are who are graduates, who are working on their own fiction, and um, who are obviously intensely interested in these questions of how things work and and uh, what they can learn from from analyzing style. Now, as you've described your methods, I suppose we should clear up. As distinct from what other methods that are more prevalent in book reviewing or in literary criticism, however you want to divide those two fields. I, I think the, the the sort of thing I try to do is to is to, is to create a kind of third space in journalism, uh, which is neither exactly like uh, book reviewing as we think of short book reviews, and isn't exactly like scholarly academic work either. But that o- occupies some some third space or middle space, in which I'm able to write longer pieces. I generally write three or four thousand word. Uh, Pieces in which there is some space to put a novel in its literary and historical context, which might involve uh, talking about about uh, 19th or 18th century writers and so on, um, and then also to be able to take things apart, to be able to look at a paragraph and 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 spend some time really uh, analyzing a writer's uh, a writer's style. The truth is, however many people are interested in doing such a thing, not many reviewers have the opportunity because they, they they just don't have the space. They're working at short length. I was talking not long ago on this program, actually probably about a year ago, with Mark Sarvis, who, as you know, runs the Elegant Variation, that literary web blog, and he's he often discusses your work on the blog. Mm. And we were talking about your work on the program, and we got to the subject of the fact that we consider you to be a non-academic critic. And, of course, you mentioned that you do teach. You teach at Harvard. I mean, that's yeah. fairly academic. But we do think of you as a non-academic because, of course, you chose not to get a Ph.D. Yeah. And you have a background that is thus very different from most people who write, the, who write on books at the length you do. What does that give you, the, the, 
the, the distance, we'll call it, from academia? I think what it gives me is, uh, h- however romanticized an idea this is, um, I, still have an, uh, I still have a picture in my head of the common reader. Now, recently, um, th- my book was reviewed uh, in the New York Times, and some scorn was poured on this idea by, by the reviewer of my appealing to the common reader, and the criticism was, surely this book is far too academic, it makes far too many allusions, and so on, the common reader won't be able to, essentially won't be able to keep up. And so there's always this, there's always this question, you know, what is more, what is more condescending to, uh, to make lots of uh, high-flown allusions and believe that the common reader uh, can, as it were, catch up, or to assume, like this critic of my book did, um, by all accounts, that such things simply befuddle the common reader and the common reader isn't up to it. I'm aware of the, 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 the difficulty of, of in, 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 in our age of, of continuing a fairly high-flown, high, fairly rigorous discourse that's aimed at non-academic readers. Nevertheless, I know what it's like because I was one, I've been one myself. Um, when I left, you know, when I was leaving university, I, I had a choice, you know, did I want to stay on and do a PhD and so on? And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get out of the, the environs of, of, of the academy. I wanted to be in a, a big city um, trying to earn a living by the pen. And that's still a romance for me. I also wanted to communicate with um, the sort of reader I was then and, and still am, um, an educated but, in, but above all intensely um, uh, passionate reader of fiction. And we certainly know that there are plenty of, plenty of those around. So whenever somebody writes about your work or your newest book that there is no such thing as the common reader, do you say to yourself, well, he wrote the book that this person is reviewing. How could he say there's no common reader? <laughs> I do, and I get you know I get lots I get letters from from whatever the common reader is. I mean, it is it, it is a it's a silly term because necessarily, if you're a critic, I mean, I you know if you earn your living by being a critic, then at some level you're not a common reader. You're an uncommon reader. You're trying to be a good reader, the best reader there is. You're also trying to, as it were, if this doesn't sound too pompous, you're also trying to train your reader, um, the person who's reading you, into being something of an uncommon reader, too. You're pulling that reader along and saying, now, look, I'm going to try to take you through this, and I think you can learn, and I think you can uh, benefit from it, and, and so on and so forth. There, there is something a little pedagogical, um, and if you, if you want to see it that way, um, perhaps even a, a little um, elitist about it, but the fact is there is still a space, it seems to me, an important one that, it, that exists in American journalism for intellectual for an intellectual discourse that isn't the simplest that's to say it isn't you know what most film reviews have become you know thumbs up thumbs down star ratings and so on but isn't simply a, a private a, a private academic language so that's what I'm 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 trying to do and I think you know when I think of who would like this book I think of myself at 20 or or perhaps better still at 18 just about to go to university fishing around for not really with any sense yet of what it would mean to, to study literature rigorously or formally, um, but fishing around for, for, for joyful criticism, for something that really opens things up and, and makes, you, makes fiction alive. Do you think in some respects you've written in that way a young person's book? Well, I like to think so, uh, even though I, 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 I know that there are, there are probably some old-fashioned elements in the book, uh, not least the sort of references I make to Flaubert and Henry James and, and, that, and that kind of thing. Um, but there are lots of contemporary writers mentioned in the book, Norman Rush and Philip Roth and Bellow, uh, Marilyn Robinson, Kurt Zier and, and so on. I, I, I think, I hope that there's a, there's a grounding in, in the old masters, uh, but there's also a sense that, that fiction is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, obviously a continuing and changing uh, business. When you're writing a book review for, say, The New Yorker, and you're picturing who this is for in your mind, how much is it of, say, the person you wrote, how fiction works for yourself at age 18? How much is it the common reader? How much is it the person that The New Yorker's demographic studies tell you is reading? That's a, that's a very good question because, you know, I spent, I spent 13 years... I, I started out writing for, a, for an English newspaper, The Guardian, uh, which has a, an, an educated, smallish readership 
Uh, then I went to the, the New Republic, which has a smaller uh, readership still, and I was pretty sure at the New Republic that I was probably communicating only with um, fellow writers and academics. At the New Yorker, where the readership is all you know is is, is almost a million, I'm aware sometimes a, a, a little awkwardly that it's a much I'm dragging a much wider net through the water. And what, what that does for me is that I, I, I feel I have to slow down a little bit and explain a little bit more, take a little bit less for granted in terms of shared illusions and so on. But I'm always surprised by you know, the letters I get from... I get many more letters at The New Yorker than I ever, ever used to at The New Republic, obviously, because there are many more people reading them, the pieces. Um, and they're from you know, all over the country, um, people doing different kinds of things, Hardly any of them are from academics. I wanted to ask about the difference between these two forums, and you've already gotten into it, the New Republic and the New Yorker. Now, you've, you've mentioned, of course, the wider readership. How different do you feel a James Wood review is or has become in the New Yorker than it was in the New Republic? Well, I hope not very different at all. But I suppose there's a, as I say, there's a, there's a kind of, um, the New Republic has a readership of about 70,000. With something small like that, there's a there's a kind of luxury uh, which is that which is the almost you might say the luxury luxury of obscurity. Uh, it's the sense that if you're noticed, you'll be noticed tardily, uh, maybe in a year or two's time, and you'll be noticed sort of first by academics, and then slowly you'll go into the into the larger populist current insofar as it exists. At the New Yorker, there's there's a stronger emphasis on the initial impact the piece might have uh, the stronger em- uh, emphasis on being on time with a book review. You know, the book review should be timed for when the book comes out, whereas the New Republic was very um, sort of snobbish about that kind of uh, timekeeping. All these sort of, I think all this plays into, uh, is, is, all this is kind of perching on your shoulder, watching you write as you write, and probably does subtly affect the way one writes. Um, but at the moment, I've, I'm not aware of, uh, of huge differences. That there's a there's a practical one, which is the pieces at the New Republic were longer and could go on and on, sometimes five, six thousand words. And I don't have quite that scope at the at the New Yorker. But you know, brevity isn't such a bad thing either. And that space you get is certainly to your advantage in both the New Republic and the New Yorker, even though it's a bit smaller. But I, I think back to your days in the Guardian you talk about, your days at the Guardian, and you got about, what, 500, 800 words then? Oh, yeah, at the most, a thousand words. And that's a, that's a tremendous discipline. It's a good thing to, 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 to be pushed to, you know, if you've, got a, you've written 1,300 words and you know that you must get it down below a thousand or it won't appear in the paper. That, that's an extremely good discipline, and maybe one, one takes the same talents, ideally one takes the same talents into the, into the larger form uh, too, but no, it's a, it's a great it's a great uh, freedom this uh, to be able to write long form, and I do think that it's one of the it's one of the great um, virtues of a, uh, always has been and it still is of American literary journalism. Uh, British literary journalism is by and large still a newspaper world. The magazines, are, insofar as there are magazines, there there they they run shortish reviews, but American literary journalism for a long time now has had. You know these tremendous magazines like The Nation, New Republic, Harper's, Atlantic, New Yorker, New York Review of Books, where I think a very vibrant uh, literary culture is is going on. And although you know we may we may talk about where the novel's at, I actually feel pretty pretty happy about the state of the essay uh, in America. I don't think, for instance, Edmund Wilson or Randall Jarrell, if they came back from the 1950s or 1960s and saw what was going on in 2008 the variety, the intelligence, uh, the length of pieces would be uh, at all um, disappointed by what they saw. Do you think that the Internet is a contributor to the revival of the essay, if you think there is one? The essay as such doesn't seem to exist in the same way uh, on the Internet. I mean, there are, there are literary bloggers like, uh, like Dan Green and so on who are, who are writing long pieces and posting them. In general, of course, the, the literary blogs do shorter stuff, little jabs and counter jabs and, and, and so on. So it, they may not contribute much to the, 
the development of the essay, but I think they definitely contribute to the general sense that there are things importantly at stake in the literary world and that there are all kinds of arguments and counter-arguments going on in a larger world that isn't just a print world. I mean, for instance, I know that I, you know, I follow quite a few blogs and practically all the, all the kind of fights and uh, discussions I've had, not all of them pleasant, it has to be said, but practically all the discussions and fights I've had about, say, um, realism versus the avant-garde, um, about the direction American fiction is going, um, have been um, internet-based rather than print-based. It will come as no surprise to you when I say that there's a lot of opinions strongly pro and strongly anti your own work. I can only think of like a few other names of book critics who get that same amount of opinion, gener- who generate that same amount of opinion. Maybe Michiko Kakutani sometimes, I don't know. But what do you think people are responding to, both the ones who very much like you and both the ones who very much dislike you? What is the central essence here that's getting them fired up? There are, there are good and bad reasons for some of that controversy. Uh, at times when I read stuff in, on the Internet in particular, sometimes in print, I feel that the bad reasons are no more than that a certain group of people have a set of writers uh, that they feel must be praised, like uh, Pynchon and DeLillo, and if they are not, it's almost like a checklist, you know, if they haven't been checked off on the list, then by definition, that critic, you know, is a reactionary, a fogey, uh, you know, whatever the the term is, um, and, and I do think that at the, bad, at the sort of low level that that's fundamentally a sort of political decision, however much it's masquerading as an aesthetic one. Um, at the higher level, I think there, there is a, a real, an, an interesting struggle going on in American fiction and in, and in the discourse about American fiction, which, for instance, isn't going on at all in Britain uh, in the same way, uh, in which an avant-garde is, as it sees itself, fighting uh, a rearguard action against um, a dominant, popular American realism. And insofar as I am liked or disliked, it's because I am allied with that kind of popular American realism. Now, in truth, that's a pretty large caricature of what, of what I am as a, as, a, as a critic, because I don't even particularly like that kind of solid American realism anyway. In fact, I often write against it. But I also interestingly think that these two sides, realism on one side and, and the avant-garde on the other, caricature each other's positions. And one of the things I was trying to do in How Fiction Works was to expand the idea of, 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 of realism, um, to sort of throw out the technical term and just expand the idea of the real in fiction so that, it, so that the real might be um, any number of, of true experiences that we feel when we read fiction that might come in all sorts of formal packages, radical or, or conservative. I was aware when I was, particularly in the last chapter of, the, of, the, of my book, I was aware that I was trying to weigh in a little bit on these, uh, on, on, on these battles. Now, since there's so much to talk about in your book, let's move on right to that with that nice segue. How fiction works begins, not quite begins, but early on, you come down hard and in favor of free indirect style. And I was going to say what that was myself, but you don't tell James Wood what free indirect style is. So if you could perhaps define it. It's one of those terms that uh, the writers don't use much themselves. And if you say to a writer, ah, you're using free indirect style, he's likely to say, oh, that's what it is. Oh, I've never called it that. Um, writers sometimes call it close, close third person and that kind of thing. But it's essentially something that narrative tends to do anyway which is that when you write in the third person about someone and it's tied to a character, the, the narration seems to bend itself around the character's way of thinking, the character's way of seeing uh, the world, so that the words begin to shift away a little bit from the author and seem to be generated almost by the character himself or herself. That's probably the, that's probably the shortest definition that I can, that I can think of. There's a nice one by, by, by David Lodge, uh, which is simply goes something like this. Cinderella looked at the clock. Midnight, time to go. And that's his 
That's his sort of one-line definition of what free and direct style is. That's to say, it isn't Cinderella looked at the clock, open quotes, it is time, she thought to herself. Just Cinderella looked at the clock, midnight, time to go. Um, you, you, you're still in third person, but you're imperceptibly shifting when you have when, from Cinderella in third person to time to go uh, into something like first person or almost stream of consciousness. Is it the mark of a good user of free and direct style that the reader can always, without fail, tell where on the spectrum between author and character the text is? No, I think, I think almost the other way, uh, that, that, that it might be a sign of a, a really good writer that you can't tell um, and that you're al- you've almost been unaware that you've been drifting away, as it were. It's this drift that I love. We all know what third person sort of so-called omniscient narration is like. We all know what it's like when, you know, when I say you know, he came into the room, he was 45, um, short brown hair, glasses, and was wearing you know, a, a shabby jacket or something. That's the most standard kind of narration to us, and it, it's often very consoling in its solidity and so on. What we tend to do as readers is, is when, when a writer is doing something well, I think, is, is, is not be aware as the, 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 the narration is slowly drifting away from that kind of objectivity um, and that the words are being colored by, sort of stained by the character himself. The, the, the line I use in the book is a fairly simple one, and it's something like this. It's just, Ted watched the orchestra through stupid tears. I don't think most people would give that line another thought if they, if they, encounter, if they, if they were reading a passage about somebody at a concert who was being moved by, by what he was hearing. Uh, I don't think anyone would give it a thought. They would just keep on reading. But I wanted to alert readers to, that, to the oddity, in a way, of that word stupid, that it does in an instant a whole host of things for us. It makes us, makes us think, now, why would, these, why would these tears feel stupid to this person? Is he embarrassed about crying? Yes, likely. Isn't it his word? Yes, it's his word. And suddenly the sentence is very much from Ted's point of view. Ted watched the orchestra through stupid tears. We're in his mind. We've just been placed inside his language. That's what I like about it. Um, without the author having to flag it as such. Is it too much of a character, too much of a caricature rather, of your authorial or your critical perspective as the author of criticism to say that you consider the free and direct style to be the style a novel that works or any type of fiction that works will use? I think that's overdoing it. I mean, part, part of the problem of writing a book, I, I should say that I didn't want this book to be called How Fiction Works. I wanted it to be called The Nearest Thing to Life, which is a lovely line from a George Eliot essay where she talks about how fiction is the nearest thing to life because it opens up our sympathies with our fellow men and so on. And the nearest thing to life is just such a lovely phrase and, and uh, it would have been perfect, but, but the, the, there was a general feeling that, um, with the publisher that, that the book... If I call it the nearest thing to life, that the book then needed a subtitle, and that everything I've written before has needed a subtitle, and that, you know, why not? There's a certain advantage in just calling a book what it fundamentally is. And there are, Anyway, so I didn't quarrel with that title, but the different difficulty is that then you set yourself up. It seems that every choice you make, if you write about free and direct style but don't write about plot, it seems as if you, you must be saying, you know, this is how, how fiction should be, there's only one way of doing it. I don't think it's the only or best way. Um, I wrote a novel myself, not perhaps a very good one, but which was n- narrated by an unreliable first narrator, and I like unreliable narration, and I like first-person narration too. I think that when you're writing in third person and using free and direct style, particularly where it, it gets close to stream of consciousness, then you probably have a greater flexibility than you do when you're writing in first person. I mean, an, an example of this is someone like Saul Bellow, who is so good at going from omniscient narration into free and direct style, and then within a paragraph, uh, he, can, he can shift from third person to first person. He's, he's, he's so good at just getting inside his character's voices that you hardly notice suddenly that his character, without quotation marks, uh, that his character is suddenly speaking in first person, straight to the, straight to the reader. So I think there's a greater flexibility, but Lord knows, I mean, there are so many different ways of writing fiction that it would be unwise to 
to, to lay down. It's just I'm 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 especially I'm especially interested in free and direct style because it opens up the, a question that runs throughout this book, which is, as Martin Amos once put it, who's in charge? Is it the stylish author, or probably the slightly less stylish character who is seeing the world, sometimes with his own language and sometimes with the with the author's language? This seems to be a particular tension in narration generally, you know, sort of after Flaubert, uh, when writers become, you know, very stylish. And uh, I think it's, it's a tension that's still a, a, alive in, in contemporary fiction. So I was trying to follow that tension through. I couldn't help but notice that in the middle of what you were last saying, you mentioned your own novel, The Book Against God, and you called it perhaps not very good. Were you just giving your own book a mediocre review? I think I was giving it a mediocre review. Um, <laughs> If I write if I write a second book, it will be to because of the, because of the intense pleasure of of, uh, of doing better second time round than the first time. Do you consider the book against God fiction that doesn't quite work? Well, first of all, of course, it was very interesting because I found myself breaking not exactly rules, but breaking certain emphases um, and quasi rules that, as a critic, I'd sort of set up. I mean, I you know. Uh, suddenly, I felt I, I found myself to be writing a novel um, that had lots of, you know, essayistic passages in it um, that seemed over intellectual, etc., uh, etc. Et um, it didn't seem to have the sort of organic shape and subtlety that I was after. But so it was interesting just to just the process of um, of writing it. But yes, I mean, I think when I when I when I look at it, I think it, with, a, with a clear eye, I can see certain things it does well and uh, certain things it does very poorly. I was aware while I was writing it of having, for instance, very little sense of novelistic form. I didn't exactly know. I didn't know what, you know, what should come after, you know, what if two should come after one and three should come after two. I, I It seemed to me that three could come after eight, as it were. I, I, I didn't have a sense of of spatial form, and I suddenly thought to myself, that's the sign of a great novelist. If someone like Tolstoy is able to keep, you know, a thousand pages in his head and have a sort of three-dimensional sense of the form of the book, um, that that seems to me a, a, a great feat. I must know, were you at all tempted to pseudonymously publish a review of the book, of your own book somewhere? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I must say that I'm less tempted to write a pseudonymous review of my book than I am to write a pseudonymous uh, novel. I would greatly like to write a second novel um, and to ask the publisher if it could be published under a different name. Uh, perhaps one could be coy about it in a kind of Joe Kleinish way um, and just say that uh, you, know, you know David Robson is the pseudonym of someone well known in the literary world or something and leave it at that just to get people interested. But but it would be it would of course be very exciting to see what would be made of uh, of a novel I might write without people having to talk about my criticism uh, I mean when the novel came out, there was inevitably the the sort of structure of re- of reviews was something like this um, James Wood is a very severe critic who calls for nothing less than masterpieces from the people he reviews. Is this book a masterpiece? No, it's not. And then having got that out of the way, sometimes you'd have actually quite an interesting or fruitful review of my, of my novel. But there was, never, it, there was never anyone coming to it um, as anything other than a critic's novel. In your position at that time, I would have just imagined that every novelist, and of course many novelists are reviewers themselves, there's much trade back and forth between those professions. I would imagine every novelist I had, who I had said had done a subpar effort in recent times would just be lined up knives in hand to review my book. Was that anything like you feared? It happened a little bit. Um, it didn't happen much in America, actually. Um, it happened in a couple of places in Britain, people people getting their own back. But on the whole, um, on the whole, it, it wasn't it wasn't reviewed by by novelists. It was reviewed... I mean, the, 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 I think the sad thing about being reviewed is that, uh, if this doesn't sound absurdly um, self-disqualifying, is that one gets one tends to get reviewed by other literary journalists um, and not by novelists. For instance, for me, it's a great sadness that how fiction works has now been reviewed extensively in Britain and America. 
and is being reviewed only by academics uh, or by literary journalists. There are a couple of li those literary journalists also write novels, but but the sort of review that I would would have been really interested in would have been a working novelist, um, someone thinking about these issues who hardly ever writes literary journalism, um, but who wanted to make something of you know to see what he or she thought of of of, of this book. I think that could have been really enriching, but it didn't happen. Who ideally would be some of the novelists you would like to have reviewed how fiction works? Ah, well, I, I dedicated the book to Norman Rush, uh, so Norman Rush couldn't have reviewed it, but I would have loved Norman Rush, who I greatly admire and I think is much neglected in this country, to have reviewed it. Um, I can imagine someone like um, Mona Simpson uh, reviewing the book, or even, you know, if, you, if one is going to get a negative review, then let the negative review be, as it were, let, let the let the anti-traditional or, or avant-garde review, which comes down heavily against my book, let it be written at the, at the highest level of, of, um, uh, of intellect by someone who's got a real aesthetic stake in these questions and isn't just um, you know, pushing a political line. If you're just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas from Colin Marshall Radio at colinmarshallradio.com. My guest is James Wood, New Yorker book critic and Harvard professor of literary criticism, author of How Fiction Works. To get back to the actual content of How Fiction Works itself, I wanted to find out, now you've mentioned, although I suppose I already know this, but I want the audience to know, you've mentioned that you wanted to push away an old idea of what realism was and install something new in its place. What did you want to replace? Well, first of all, I just want to blow away a few cobwebs and to say that I'm not... A I'm not sure what a realistic novel is, and I'm not sure I've ever really encountered one. Whenever you, whenever you tend to encounter a writer or a novel you think uh, is, or you're told is, is a classic of its kind, a realist, you know, of realism, it turns out actually not to be very realistic. It turns out to break with verisimilitude in all sorts of ways, to have elements of symbolism, uh, to reflect on its own artifice, etc., etc. Um, and as I say at the end of the book, all the great realists uh, have also been great formalists, necessarily so, because the first business for any writer is, you know, how can I put it together? What can I do as a stylist? And so on and so forth. So, first of all, it was just this thing of trying to get away from this awful term, realism. I'm not sure that I come up with a better term, which is I, 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 I come up with a rather awkward neologism of lifeness. That's to say, not life-likeness. No one wants life-likeness. Uh, why would we want to go to the page for that? We have plenty of life-likeness in our own lives. Um, that's what it is to be alive. But lifeness would be new life, you know, li life brought to new life by, by the highest artistry uh, on the page. As I say, I'm not sure that that either as a, as, as a neologism or as a, even as a, as a definition that gets us anywhere. But it was simply to expand this idea of what of what the real is, um, to try and push it away from verisimilitude, from, from, from the credible, and to push it more towards a sense of, of, of truth. That's to say, you know, we, we can read all kinds of different books. You know, we can go and watch a performance of Endgame or uh, read a novella by Thomas Bernhardt or read Gulliver's Travels and also read, you know, a solidly realistic book like, you know, Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates. And in all those different cases, with very different aesthetic forms, we will feel that something humanly at stake, there's something humanly at stake in those books uh, and in, in, in those plays, that our lives have been touched and that something about our lives has been importantly stated and, and, and shaped and presented and dramatized and so on. So it was just, it was really, it's not that I think the term realism can be replaced, because I think we probably can't do without it, but it's just to try and enlarge the sense of what the, of what, of what the real could be uh, uh, in fiction. Uh, in a way, it's to encroach on, on the avant-garde camp, to steal a little bit of their, of their radical bona fides, and to say, you know, even at, at, at a fairly advanced level of, of aesthetic radicalism, there are still plenty of the old traditional questions coursing through that work. You know, um, does it touch our lives? Uh, does it say something about the world? Is it in some way connected to, to the world as we know it? And, and so forth. 
one feud that was that received a bit of press, I don't know, about 10 years ago, was that uh, Tom Wolf had was with John Updike. And you'd read these pieces from Wolf saying, oh, Updike's doing this boring thing. I'm doing something exciting. And Updike would say, well, Wolf isn't doing art. I'm doing art. And it's funny because you are lukewarm to both Updike and Wolf, it seems. Is there a common problem that makes their fiction not work when it doesn't work? No, I don't think there is a common problem. I, um, I think that's probably just me being a bit cussed. But um, the truth is, I think Updike's right, that Updike is doing something artistic that, that is not ultimately within Wolf's capacities, as a, at least as a fiction writer. But Updike is, is a writer who I had, I've had great admiration for, like everyone has. Um, the early Rabbit books, The Centaur, uh, Rogers' version. Rogers' version is a super, super book uh, in all kinds of ways. I just think that he squandered the last, Ten or twelve years of 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 his of his writing, um, as has been observed by other people, the moment that Philip Roth got a second wind and became a great late novelist, uh, a novelist of aging and of impotence and death and so on, seems to have been exactly to correspond exactly to the years in which Updike decided just to go onto autopilot uh, and to fritter it, fritter it away, almost obsessively pursuing it. Seems to me. Um, productivity at any at any cost. That's to say, just keep on churning out a novel a year, a novel a year, a novel a year, alternating it with essays and the like. And it does it doesn't make any sense to me. It's as if all the metaphysical pressure has gone off. Um, and so I've been hard on Updike uh, really since I came to America in 1995, because that's pretty much corresponded to to to, to Updike sort of you know slackening off. And I've been correspondingly full of praise for Roth, like most people have. Uh, even when I, there are individual books I don't like, because I feel that there are important things at stake for him. But I have a hugely admired Updike in, 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 in the past. You have a great deal more of a problem than with a novelist you know is capable of great things that is just kind of sitting on the laurels. Yes, that's what I... Absolutely. Um, I'm, uh, I, I do demand a lot, and I know that can it can seem sermonizing or hectoring to... Uh, to people, but if you don't have, I mean, I, I don't know why you would be a critic if you didn't have the, the highest standards. Yes, I, I, if you know a writer can do really well and seems to be doing subpar work, then that's probably, that's, that, that's probably the case that excites one's ire most. Since we're talking about the ways in which fiction can fail, in the framework of how fiction works, how does fiction, and this is in a general sense, how often does fiction, in what way does it most commonly not work? What are the Achilles heels of any book? Well, one of them, and I actually mention Updike in this connection in the, in the book, one of them is to get, is in some way to mess up this tension that's there as a trap anyway for the writer, which is this question of, of how to continue to be the sort of writer you want to be, that's to say producing your nice polished sentences and the rest of it, while also plausibly looking at the world in the way that a character would with the sort of words that a character might use. And I mention as, a, as an example, it seems to me, of failure in this regard, Updike's novel Terrorist, in which he really does not manage to enter the mind of an 18-year-old um, would-be bomber and Muslim living in New Jersey. And it's not simply that he doesn't enter into it. There are plenty of novelists who... That would be an intensely difficult thing to do. It's not clear that any American novelist has yet managed to take us inside the mind of an 18-year-old would-be bomber. Um, it's, it's the way in which Updike fails to do it that interests me, which is that, which is that he, he, tends to, he tends to wrap the character in, in, in veils of his own language, and his own language is a real obstruction, constantly causing the reader to think, but this isn't remotely the way this young man would see things or say things. Uh, this is this is Updike's uh, worldview because it's Updike's language world. So that seems to me a pretty crucial thing is getting this fiddling in the, in with, with the proper calibration, fiddling with this tension that's always there uh, in fictional in fictional narrative. And then generally, uh, the the other thing I suppose are the ways in which fiction novels don't work is. Is and this is an, an again an intensely hard thing to do. I know I, I was very guilty of it when I wrote my novel, and which is, 
you know, knowing how to pursue your themes without um, without pressing on them too hard, uh, without without showing your hand too obviously. For most readers, I think we've all had that experience where a book is somehow spoilt when we feel the writer is bringing up the crucial theme uh, and aligning his characters with it, having his characters mention it and speak it um, formally, you know, formally present it to us, uh, rather than letting that theme come come naturally out of out of a dramatic situation. Speaking of themes, and once again, the book against God, although this is a theme that seems to run through your entire career, the main character of your novel, Thomas Bunting, is uh, not, you, you would call him not a religious believer, at least for most of the book, correct? Yes. And you are yourself not a religious believer, am I right? Yes. How can someone who doesn't have religious belief in the way that you don't, how can you be, I don't want to use the word fixated, but how can you have such an interest in the very concept of belief? Well, you know, some of it will be will, will be personal, and uh, I think people who, who grew up in religious households and, and then broke with, their, with the premises of their parents' belief do continue to have a, an intense relationship with it. Uh, and I often bump into people who, you know, had evangelical parents or something like that, or strongly Catholic parents. In a couple of cases, I've, I've had very good conversations with, with writers who have quite strict Islamic parents and who feel they, who felt that they could barely write fiction uh, while their parents were still alive. So I think you know you, you inevitably continue to have the, uh, an, a, a, an intense interest in what you've cast off. I think more generally, there's an interesting thing about atheism, as opposed to simply not having any belief, um, which is that atheism is a state of rebellion, and therefore necessarily, again, you're always in a relation with the thing you're supposed to have, have cast off. Instead of having simply cast off, cast it off, you're wrestling with it. Now, logically speaking, you shouldn't be wrestling with it. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be wrestling with something, with a God you don't actually believe in. Um, you should have been able to simply uh, shuck it off. But we know, we know because of this category of atheism, of angry atheism, think of, of a book like Dawkins' book or Hitchens' book, that they aren't just, they're not simply serene statements uh, of disbelief. They are, they're uh, out and out fights. And in both cases, I think you'll find that it's because these are writers who, who, uh, who grew up in, in some kind of religious environment and haven't been able to get rid of that. And that's the case, and that's the case certainly for me. I've just given the negative presentation. The positive presentation, I hope, is that unlike certain kinds of writers about about theological issues, I'm at least able to... I do have a sense of, of what of the sort of majesty of belief, of what, of what it might be to... Not just the credulity of belief, but what it might be to actually intensely believe in uh, in God. And, you know, going back to this question of the Updike novel, a lot of American novelists are at the moment trying to write about terrorists. And they're, do, they, they're doing that with more or less success. What I think they're not doing with much success is, is putting us in the shoes of people who have intensely submitted to uh, a set of religious beliefs and, and, and who are in a state of passionate obedience to those, to those beliefs. And that's probably because most secular writers um, are, are, not, you know, are not in any way prepared for or set up for Crediting that belief, so I, you know, I try when I write about these issues, I, 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 I don't let, I'm, I'm perfectly honest about the fact that I'm not a believer, but I do try as hard as I can to, to credit the other side. I will occasionally have conversations with or read pieces by someone who will be talking about your work, and they'll, they'll, they'll think they're telling me the story of James Wood when they say, well, what he did was he used to believe in God, he took that off the pedestal, took God off the pedestal, and on the pedestal he put belief in fiction. How much of a caricature is that? What, what's your comment on that sort of perception of you? It, it's probably so sort of psychologically true. Um, I think intellectually it shouldn't be the case. That's to say, I don't think anything is a substitution for anything else, or it shouldn't be. It could almost go the other way, which is, it's certainly true that I may have 
transferred a kind of zeal or passion from religion to fiction. But actually, insofar as I'm interested, intensely interested in fiction and in questions of realism and belief, it's partly because I think that fiction is almost the opposite, at least, the opposite of the kind of, of fairly stern evangelical uh, environment I grew up in. That environment was hostile to the secular, and above all, I think the novel is a secular form. Not very interested in comedy, and I think the novel is, above all, really a comic form in, in its deepest sense. And in that evangelical framework, you have to simply submit, you have to, you have to believe. Faith is everything. Faith is the crucial test. And in fiction, obviously, the interesting thing is that obedience isn't demanded in the same way. There is an element of faith. That there is a way in which a writer is saying, come with me and I will convince you. But you're always free at any moment to not be convinced, for one thing. And then the writer himself is often in the business of, 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 of breaking that um, link anyway, um, of, of not, just a, not, not just radical and avant-garde writers, but, but there are all sorts of ways in which in which novels play around with the idea of, of what it is to believe and break the link between the reader and the uh, and the author between the between belief and 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 the author and I, I like that I like that sort of interruption that goes on and that and that at least in in classic theological terms that interruption probably shouldn't be allowed because if it, if it were it would be um, it would be disbelief it would be heresy. Now, we're getting up to the end of time here, but I wanted to ask you one more thing, and it's going to sound like a pretty simple question, but I want to ask you what you consider your job to be. And when I say that, I don't mean when you're sitting down to write a review for The New Yorker. I don't mean your job being to have something to hand in to David Remnick or whoever. I mean, what is your goal when you're writing about books? What what are you doing for the world in your mind? I think, in a word, it would be vicariousness, which doesn't sound like very much. Um... It sounds horribly secondary for one thing, but there's this lovely phrase that Henry James uses about the critic, which is that he says his life is heroically vicarious. It seems to me that what above all one is trying to do is to say to the reader, and this, of course, is analogous to the business of writing fiction, is to say to the reader, I've had this tremendous experience just reading this novel, being in this fictional world, being in this verbal universe. I want you to share this with me. I want to transmit it to you. And I transmit it to you in this curious secondary way, which is to essentially re-describe what I've just experienced in much shorter form, of course. And I, I'm going to do that mindful of the fact that I may also be criticizing the book, mindful of the fact that the reader may never actually get to the book itself. I mean, this is a, a truth about the reviews we write that, that Often the, the review will stand in for the book, will be the reader's experience of the book. Even if that weren't the case, I think the, the principle of vicariousness is the same, um, which is to offer criticism as a kind of passionate redescription uh, of, the, of the work itself, to make it live again in a different place, on a different page. The book, once again, is How Fiction Works. James Wood, an honor and a privilege having you on the program. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Our music is produced by Ben Althaus. Hear more of his stuff at benalthaus.com. Find out more about the Marketplace of Ideas or visit our online show archive at colinmarshallradio.com.